All right, everybody, we are going to be talking about upper respiratory disorders, um, which is the part one of our respiratory disorders, which are going to be upper. First one is rhinitis. Um, one thing I covered in class that you're going to see common theme through all these upper respiratory disorders is that they're most likely to be viral, um, even though um, it can be bacterial and most importantly is transmission through droplets. So as nursing management is going to be about educating your patients about prevention um, and to prevent spreading of this. So a lot of the symptoms are going to cross over a lot. Um, you can see some coexistent of disorders, um, but just think if rhinitis, we're talking about the nose, so you have a runny nose, um, might also have itchy, watery eyes, um, sore throat, and sometimes a low-grade fever. Um, but as we go along, it's going to be, how do we talk to a patient about basically addressing the common cold? Times of year, if you work in clinics, pediatrics, or in your normal MD offices, you're going to see a higher incident during the winter months, January, January February, March, and April, um, but then of course when kids go back to school. Again, symptoms typically last 10, 10 to 12 days, but if a cold kind of goes beyond that, and there are worsening symptoms, it may have gone to a possible bacterial infection. Now, it can also exasperate the herpes simplex 1 virus, which basically is cold sores. Um, so that's kind of where it gets its name from. Um, so be mindful of that, that it can um, kind of exasperate if somebody already has the um, HSV1 um, virus lying dormant within their body. Nursing education. So a big thing um, anytime somebody has rhinitis or this is part of the common cold is going to be rest. Uh, increased fluid intake. Why is that? Anytime you're sick your metabolism is increased so you're actually losing more fluids and are at a higher risk of dehydration. Um, increased fluids can also help um, thin out any um, thickened mucus that may be in the nasal passages. Um, encourage the use of home humidifiers. Um, again, that just helps keep nasal passages humidified because sometimes you may even have thickened mucus or you may have patients that are dry, which can lead to epistasis. Um, and you just have to think about the nasal passages that if it creates a environment for bacteria, that is typically when a viral infection can transition itself into a bacterial infection. Um, proper disposal of tissues, because again, this is droplets, um, hand hygiene, proper ways to cough. We like to tell our children to cough like they're a vampire um, with their arms across their face and not into their hands. Try to limit exposure to others. Um, there has been some research about complementary therapies to kind of help uh, promote the immune response like vitamin C, zinc, and echinacea. Know your medications, especially the classes, just knowing what uh, they do. Um, your antihistamines can help prevent edema and itching, but know to um, caution with older patients um, because if you think of antihistamine, the one of the most common ones is over-the-counter Benadryl. Um, it can cause sedation, vertigo, um, hypertension, and urinary retention um, because of their drying effect. Um, nasal decongestants can constrict the blood vessels and help decrease edema. Um, no, with the nasal decongestants, um, it's really for short-term use only. Um, Long-term use can actually lead to rebound nasal congestion. Um, it can also raise a person's blood pressure. So unfortunately, you'll see um, a lot of the over-counter cold medications uh, really should not be used with individuals who have problems with like uncontrolled hypertension. Um, and I think there are some 
over-the-counters out there that are actually geared towards those um, with hypertension. The intranasal uh, glucocorticoid steroid sprays um, are most effective to help with treating seasonal and um, perennial rhinitis. Your antipyretics, that's going to be your Tylenol. Um, and of course, antibiotics only use if a bacterial infection can be identified or if the symptoms, like I said earlier, go kind of beyond that 10 to 14 day mark and you have worsening symptoms. Um, that's when usually a physician is going to possibly suspect that now we have a bacterial infection going on um, and they'll go ahead and do like a broad spectrum of antibiotics. So sinusitis is just basically um, rhinitis now um, complicating with one or more of these sinuses. Um, it can typically end up as a sinus infection because the swelling of the mucus will actually block the drainage of the secretions. So that's when if you've ever had um, a cold that you feel has gone into your sinuses, in terms of symptoms, you'll have the addition of facial pressure and pain, especially if you tilt your head forward. Um, drainage from your nose might be bloody or uh, purulent. Um, you can also have some tenderness um, when you kind of touch your forehead, the orbitals, and like the facial area. Um, I think this is a little bit more of the extreme, but sinusitis you know, doctors can make us suspect um, what's going on, but to actually confirm it will be with a CT or sinus x-ray. Um, nursing care, now that we're talking about the sinuses, um, just because of the fluid in the area, um, you want to discourage air travel, swimming or diving, um, stop smoking of any form, and to increased sinus irrigation and use of nasal sprays just because of the pressure um, changes can worsen the symptoms. Nasal decongestants, um, again we've kind of talked about it, pain relief and a broad spectrum antibiotic like amoxicillin um, if there is a confirmed bacterial infection. Obviously something else would be used if a patient does have an allergy. Um, so if you are with patients that are going to be prescribed, um, it's important to make sure you know their allergies. Education, sinus irrigation, nasal saline sprays. Again, it's all about keeping the nasal passages moist. Um, contact your primary if a patient has any additional symptoms, just because with the, um, if there's an actual infection that's gotten to sinuses, um, there is a concern that if pathogens have actually gotten into the bloodstream from the sinus cavity, um, that there can be a possible complication of like meningitis and encephalitis. So know um, these symptoms here of severe headache, um, the neck stiffness or nuchal rigidity and a high fever. Pharyngitis, um, that is going to be the inflammation of the pharynx, which is just the area in the back of the throat. So anytime, if you've ever had a doctor tell you, go, ah, they're actually looking at the back of your throat or the pharynx, so that's going to be the area. They're going to look to see if it is um, fiery red, um, involving the tonsils, if you have them, swollen lymph nodes. Um, it can be flecked with white uh, exudate, enlarged and tender. Um, a lot of times people will feel miserable, have a sore throat, and have a fever greater than 100.4. And again, it's all going to be, uh, management's going to be based on the cause. Um, <clears throat> risk factors, acute, uh, usually those are less than 25 years old, chronic can typically depend on a person's environment, um, excessive use of their voice, um, chronic cough, or habitual use of alcohol and tobacco. Laryngitis, now this is the area once here this area is Maria pharynx. Now we're talking a little bit more involvement of the throat. Um, and this is where somebody actually um, has laryngitis and can kind of lose their voice. Um, 
so symptoms, hoarseness, or um, aphonia, which is a complete loss of the voice, and a severe dry cough and sore throat. Um, onset symptoms sometimes can be aggravated by cold, dry wind. Um, people can have a sense of a tickling in their throat that's made worse by cold air and liquids. It can get worse in um, <clears throat> the evening hours and as you can see that cold seems to aggravate it but um, patients seem like their symptoms improve when they're indoors in a warmer cli climate. Um, chronic laryngitis um, can obviously be marked by persistent hoarseness and really treatment is resting the voice, avoiding irritants and um, inhaling the cool steam just to basically get the moist um, to moisturize the area. Flu, um, as you see here in terms of testing of everything is going to come across about uh, droplets um, prevention and treatment. Um, Adults are contagious for 24 hours before the manifestations and up to five days after they begin. If it's caught in time, you can do testing, um, treatment. Um, from my understanding, if it's caught right away, it can be quite expensive. Um, most individuals who are healthy, um, you just treat the symptoms. Your symptoms can have headache, muscle aches, chills, fatigue, um, severe diarrhea and cough, fever, um, and like I said, antivirals um, can be given within 24 to 48 hours after onset of symptoms, um, like Tamiflu, but as many people have told me, it is quite expensive. If a patient is hospitalized, they need to be on droplet precautions um, and please make sure you understand what droplet precautions are and how you're going to manage that patient. Hydration, again all these viruses, um, patients being sick, hydration is just going to be very important. Prevention is best and this is not just for the flu, this is basically for any type of virus. Is about proper hand washing, um, cough and sneeze etiquette, yearly immunizations, encourage your patients um, for those who are over six months of age, those who have a history of pneumonia, chronic medical conditions, pregnant, over 65 years old, or if you're a health care provider, hence why as a nursing student we need you to get your flu shot. And if you are infected, here it is. Fluid intake, rest, and stay at home. The big problem when you hear about deaths is more than likely going to be a second complication of pneumonia. And see this poor kid, mom is just wrapping him up. So droplet precautions. Know them. Um, because uh, the infected organisms can travel up to three feet from coughing, sneezing, spitting. Um, or talking, I think spitting because I have a child that likes to spit. Um, know your PPE, hand hygiene, gloves, masks, gowns, and goggles because guess what? If you go in and you have all these other things and you get near a patient and they sneeze and it goes into your eyes, oh my goodness, not good. Um, this picture over here just gives you a synopsis of all the different um, viruses that can travel um, by droplets um, and sometimes NCLEX loves to um, question you on these things so just kind of be mindful um, to that and of course these aren't all viruses some of them are bacterial but still traveling by droplets Medications, I think this is a running theme. Um, know your type of medications. Know what expectorants do. Know what an antitussive is. What a decongestant does. And um, what antihistamines can help with. 
trauma, obstruction of the upper respiratory airways. In terms of sleep apnea, please understand um, the definition of at least five obstructive um, events per hour. Complications, um, those who have hypertension um, or at increased risk of MI stroke. Risk factors, um, I think this should be important, especially if you see patients in the hospital or the clinic. Um, kind of get a picture of what that person may look like. Um, this is a little bit of an exaggeration of this individual, but obesity just shows here around the neck can narrow and compromise the upper airway so say an individual like this lays down flat on their back they're going to have collapse of their airway just because of the weight of the fat tissue um, so it's going to be typically men who are older and overweight um, or those who do have low muscle tone so those with disabilities um, or genetic disorders that um, have these issues um, like those with Down syndrome. Manifestations, frequent and loud snoring when breathing, um, sensations for 10 seconds or longer for at least five episodes per hour. So this is going to be the key thing, five episodes, 10 seconds or longer. Um, and a lot of times you hear awakening abruptly with a loud snort as the blood O2 level drops. So this is basically, this is how the body is trying to tell the person like, hey, you've stopped breathing. Um, but unfortunately, this becomes uh, a pattern. Only way it can be diagnosed is typically through um, a basis of a person's symptoms plus a sleep study. If you look at these full symptoms, um, a lot of it seems to make sense. If a person is not getting good rest, um, insomnia, loud snoring, headaches, starts to kind of to affect your mental faculties. But long-term chronic um, obstructive sleep apnea, though, as you go along, you can see is starting to affect the heart and is also affecting the lungs. Okay. <clears throat> Management uh, typically is going to uh, address, you know, maybe with causes. Um, some of it, if obesity is a factor, is going to be weight loss. Um, individuals who are at increased risk should avoid hypnotics or alcohol um, before bed. Some oral appliances will help um, reposition the mandible or tongue to kind of keep the airway open. But more commonly, if somebody is able to breathe independently, and that's really important, that they'll use a CPAP machine, which just provides continuous positive airway pressure. But if you have patients with like severe COPD um, who actually require some um, ventilator assistance, then that would be a BiPAP, okay? So just kind of know the difference in terms of um, which device would be used with which patients. So CPAP, those who can breathe independently think, um, C can breathe independently versus those that um, need some help with the BiPAP. <clears throat> Other treatments um, that are a little bit uh, more uh, radical, but if they're finding that it's something structural wise, um, can be a tonsillectomy, the uval uvulopathopharyngeoplasty, my gosh, or UPPP, and um, nasal septoplasty, especially if they find maybe somebody has a very severe uh, uh, deviated septum. Um, pharmacological therapies, um, these I would say are more like Band-Aids um, until they can maybe find the other root cause with like the provigil and the triptyl. Big, big problem, and this is your role, is about um, why they need to be wearing it. Um, because the long-term simple is 
um, lack of use, lack of getting oxygen, going for long periods of time to the body, um, put stress on the heart and lungs, and um, once you educate them, encourage them about compliance. Epistasis or nosebleed, what you need to know um, basically is the proper way to educate a patient of how to control nosebleed, which is going to be pinching the outer portion, leaning forward for five to ten minutes continuously. This is the big part. Um, packing can be used. Now if long-term packing is used for more than 48 hours, antibiotics are, pres are prescribed because of the risk of um, toxic shock syndrome. Patient education, especially if a um, person is more prone to nosebleeds, is basically avoid the activity that may cause it. Um, so if somebody has had a cold for a long period of time and it's caused by forcible nose bleeding or nose blowing, then basically you need to educate your patient about um, gentle nose blowing, maybe suctioning, something to just kind of help um, avoid uh, the cause. <clears throat> Laryngeal cancer, things you need to know for this. Most common symptom is hoarseness for more than two weeks. Um, medical management is going to be surgical. Um, as a patient, um, afterwards, keep the head of the bed um, elevated to decrease edema. Um, now, if a patient has a complete removal of the larynx, um, they're going to lose their natural voice. So be mindful in the case of how are you going to communicate with this patient. Um, you know, that's the last thing you want is to come into a room and not be mindful and start talking to them and they can't respond. So um, picture boards, uh, chalkboard, whiteboard, wh whichever is going to work best for that patient. Um, monitor for increased secretions. Um, humidification uh, to help decrease cough. Now, if a patient's in respiratory distress, O2 must be delivered through the stoma. Um, it's not going to be helpful putting it a nasal cannula. Um, and deep suctioning, you need to use sterile technique because you're going down to the lungs. All right, that's it uh, for that. And uh, why don't you just take a break and uh, move on to part two of uh, lower respiratory disorders.